So aloha, hapa day, and talofa, everyone. Thank you for joining in our all staff meeting. And we've invited um, a number of guests, including our board and um, and our volunteers and other folks. So uh, we're just thrilled today to have this special presentation. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Anne-Marie Gumataltao, who is one of our board members. And she also chairs um, our diversity, equity, and inclusion committee on the board. And so uh, with no further ado, Anne-Marie, take it away. Thank you, Diane. Yeah, we're very excited to have uh, Dan Epstein, who is the CEO and president of Special Olympics Hawaii today. Um, as you know, we had talked in our board meeting at our DEI uh, presentation, I guess it was a couple months ago, that we are trying to give outreach to um, other populations, diversity and inclusion, obviously. So uh, we are very pleased to have uh, Dan with us today. So let me just give you a brief background on him. So for 28 years, he's been an integral part of Special Olympics Hawaii, uh, previously serving as the Chief Operating Officer and Vice President of Sports. Dan has been responsible for all aspects of the Sports Department, the Development Department, health initiatives and community relations. He is a certified Special Olympics trainer in games management and has served as an Asian Pacific regional trainer for Special Olympics Incorporated uh, in July 2020. Upon the retirement of the previous CEO, he was named the new president and CEO. So welcome, Dan. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Anne Marie. I really appreciate the invitation. Um, had a pleasure, the pleasure of working with the Gumatatao family, um, and a big shout out to Peter Gumatatao, one of our awesome Special Olympics athletes, uh, who I'll brag about a little bit later on uh, in our presentation as well. But thank you so much to your family and, and all that you do for Special Olympics as well. Um, welcome, everybody. Uh, we really appreciate the opportunity to have a chance to talk to you all today about Special Olympics, spread the word a little bit about what we do. Um, we do, I think, a lot more than what people know that we do. And so this gives us an opportunity to talk about the various initiatives that we have in, uh, involved with Special Olympics, uh, both here locally in Hawaii, but also globally across the country and in, in Asia Pacific as well. So we're going to start out with just some of the basics today as far as uh, going through who we are and what we do. Um, I will talk about it from a local perspective, but also give a little bit of a, a global outlook as well on, on what we do and where our initiatives lie, a little bit on our numbers um, as well. Uh, normally, if I was in a group setting where I was in front of you guys, I would kind of ask um, who actually has ever uh, volunteered with Special Olympics before. If, so if anybody if anybody wants to just give me a hands up or a, uh, some sort of a notification, that's always kind of good to know um, who's had experience working with us before. And um, with that, I'll kind of continue to move on. So we already got one person raising their hand, so I love it. All right, thank you guys very much. So let me talk just a little bit about my background. Um, I started out in Special Olympics actually as a coach in college uh, and fell in love with the program there. We had a childhood friend with intellectual disability um, who it was always very interesting to me. Uh, and it's interesting how DEI has come around now. Um, when we were kids, we had a, a group of kids in the neighborhood that were all friends. And it just so happened that one of those individuals in our neighborhood uh, had an intellectual disability. He was a little bit older than us. And um, we were pretty protective of him because we were a pretty close group of friends that were in this neighborhood. The families all kind of knew each other. We would all play sports literally in the street, um, you know, and <clears throat> yell at each other to get out of the way when we saw cars coming. But we would play uh, uh, three on three football and basketball and things like that. And we had this one individual that would always want to play with us. He wasn't as skilled and uh, and uh, had never grown up playing ball like a lot of us had. And his name was David. Um, but he was a little bit older than us and what we saw in school, but also in the neighborhood when we went down to the community park is that quite often he would be treated pretty badly. Um, quite often get picked on, uh, quite often not included in most of the things that were happening. Um, and it struck most of us in a way that was really discouraging. Um, and quite often we were too young or we felt like we were too young and too small to do anything about it. And I think that's something that always really stuck, uh, stuck with me that um, I wasn't able to really stand up for him. Um, and 
I always felt really bad about it, to be to be really honest. Um, so when I was in college, we had the opportunity on Saturday mornings. They Luckily, the school I went to, University of Virginia, offered the opportunities for us to get very involved in the local community in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, and so I was able to get involved with coaching Special Olympics uh, every Saturday morning. One season, it was tennis. and Another season, it was basketball. Um, luckily, I had uh, the opportunity to play both when I was growing up. And uh, it really just stuck with me. And what I recognized was this is an organization that I really loved. I appreciated the Special Olympics athletes. I appreciated the joy that they brought to every practice and, and the, the atmosphere that was around it. Um, and I also honestly really loved the aspect of sports being involved um, with our program at its core. And so I grew from that and um, came out to Hawaii approximately 30 plus years ago. Um, and connected pretty much immediately uh, with Special Olympics and, and started on staff uh, doing a variety of different things and ultimately started running the sports program, um, which has been just an organization I, again, have fell in love with and, and stuck with for now moving on close to 30 years and took over the CEO role about a year and a half ago. Um, as most of you know, it's been a very interesting roller coaster ride over the last year and a half um, for me, just dealing with COVID and, and everything like that. But um, we are slowly but surely kind of coming back to some sense of uh, the new normal, uh, which starts to include some of the, the, the core events that we've been able to do and, and in-person events that we've been able to do for many, many years. So what I'd like to do is start out with sort of the basics of who we are and what we do. Um, and where we always start basically is with our mission. So the mission of Special Olympics is to provide year round sports training and athletic competition and a variety of Olympic type sports for both children and adults with intellectual disabilities, giving them continuing opportunities to develop physical fitness, demonstrate courage, experience joy, and participate in the sharing of gifts, skills, and friendships with their families, other Special Olympics athletes, and the community. Now, I do recognize that that mission statement is a mouthful. Um, what I do want to talk about is some of the basics that go along with our mission. So first off, we provide year-round sports training and athletic competition. So I do want to bring this up because quite often when I say I work for Special Olympics or I'm involved with Special Olympics, the, the, the number one question I often get is, oh, really, when is it? When is Special Olympics? And quite often here in Hawaii, people assume that I'm talking about our summer games, which 99% uh, of the time happens at the University of Hawaii uh, at the end of May or beginning of June. Um, in other state programs or global programs, that may, that may mean a major event. But what folks don't realize is that actually Special Olympics here in Hawaii and globally and across the region um, actually operates on a year-round basis. So we actually in Hawaii do three seasons a year, actually three seasons plus a one gap season, which we do at the beginning of the year. Um, and we have sports going on year round. So a Special Olympics athlete could be able to participate in a year round basis doing up to four different sports or really even five different sports in an actual calendar year. Um, we run over 45 competitions a year in all the different sports that we offer. Um, we are doing fundraising events throughout the entire year. And we also put just as much emphasis on the training as we do is on the competition side of things. So for example, if an athlete is participating in the season that we're in now, so we're in our fall season, which culminates with our event called the Holiday Classic, um, they would have started training in the beginning of September in their respective sports. The sports in this season are bowling, basketball, and bocce ball. And they would be participating right now this month, October in our area and regional competitions, which are held across the state and one of those three different sports. And then they would move on to compete at our state games, which would be the weekend before Thanksgiving in November. So November 19 and 20 for any folks that are on <clears throat> this call that are here on Oahu and would like to come out, we'd love to have you. And our, again, our event is November 19 and 20. And we actually utilize the joint base, um, Pearl Harbor Hickam and the Marine Corps base, Kanagawi Bay for, uh, to host that event. So we actually have our neighbor island athletes come over they spend the night, um, Saturday night, at one of those facilities. We have competition going on all day Saturday, all day Sunday, and then our folks fly back home or drive back home if they're on Oahu. So that's what a traditional season would look like. We have a small break for the holidays. We come back uh, in January and February. We start a flag football season, which runs just for about eight weeks. And then we get into our traditional spring sports, which culminates with our summer games. So we do track and field, swimming powerlifting and softball. And we run approximately 20 different competitions throughout the season across the state. Um, and then we also have our summertime program, which includes uh, five-a-side soccer and bocce ball. We also have some programs that do golf. Uh, and that season basically runs from uh, 
July, uh, June, July, and August with the state games that we run basically in August. So we are going year round. Now, the other thing that we quite often hear about uh, when we talk about our mission statement and we talk about our Special Olympics athletes is they'll refer to our participants as the kids, um, which is something that is entirely inaccurate, right? So our participants are individuals with intellectual disabilities and we refer to all of our participants as athletes because they're involved with our program as an athlete. They join our program to participate in sports. Um, but we also have a huge variety of ages that are participating in our program. So we have the beginning age to, to start actually competing in our program is the age of eight. Um, but we have athletes that are in their 70s still competing in Special Olympics. So our dividing line, about 50% of our athletes, uh, a little bit more than 50% of our athletes are 22 and above. Um, and just under 50% of our athletes are ages eight to 21 years old. So we are fully children and adults with intellectual disabilities. Um, our oldest athlete who just passed away a few years ago um, was still competing at the age of 79. She was an amazing woman by the name of Auntie Vivian uh, in Hilo and was still participating in bocce ball. So if you wonder, do folks still enjoy playing sports um, as they start to age? And the answer is yes. And a lot of the reasons for that was just the social aspects of being able to get out there and see their friends and enjoying the opportunity to socialize with their friends and fellow coaches, um, and then be able to see athletes from across the state when they participated in state games or athletes across the island when they participated in area or regional competition as well. So we do have something to offer athletes of every ability level and every age. Now you notice I may have said that our athletes start at the age of eight, but that's actually for competition. We actually have specialized programs for athletes that are ages two to seven now, which include developmental skills, um, build up uh, and lead up so that we can immediately focus on working with our athletes, our youngest athletes, who quite often are delayed developmentally, um, but also delayed physically. So quite often what we've seen is that participation in young athlete activities will actually enhance uh, and improve their opportunities for them to speed up their motor skill development uh, at a much younger age. And so we have a monthly program that goes on for those, uh, but we also have virtual programs that we provide out to across the state uh, for anybody that wants to participate in young athlete programs. And we also partner with uh, a variety of preschools, uh, kindergartens, uh, first grade, second grade athletes, so that they're able to participate in our young athlete development program as well. So, Again, who do we serve? We serve, again, children and adults, we're year round. Uh, and the third piece of that is we serve people with intellectual disabilities. Now, quite often we get confused with other organizations that serve, uh, that, that provide sports opportunities but for people with disabilities. Uh, the largest of those other organizations would be Paralympics. So a lot of people uh, recognize what Paralympics are around is, is especially when the Olympic Games rolls around because uh, the Paralympic Games, the uh, World Paralympic Games are held uh, generally about two weeks after the Olympics using the same facilities that the Olympics utilizes um, and that's where basically the world meets up to participate there. Special Olympics is not connected to Paralympics. The major focus of Paralympics is on people who have uh, physical disabilities uh, and also the uh, philosophy of the Paralympics versus Special Olympics is different. Special Olympics is very much a grassroots organization whose goal is to get anybody that's eligible to participate in our program uh, in any way that they would like to participate. So whether it's through uh, sports, whether it's through some of the other activities that we have, like I mentioned, our young athlete program um, or unified sports, which I'll talk about in a little while. Um, but again, it does not matter how skilled an athlete you are, uh, we have a place for you in our program. Whereas the Paralympics tends to focus on finding who are the, some of the best athletes similar to the Olympics, um, of folks that have physical disabilities. So again, sort of a big difference between, between the two. Paralympics is an amazing organization, uh, but Special Olympics is a much different philosophy and also a different target population of who we're actually trying to serve. For our elite athletes, though there is an opportunity within Paralympics, there is a division actually for those with intellectual disabilities to participate. And some of our athletes have crossed over to participate at the Paralympic level. Uh, at that sort of that world-class level of people with intellectual disabilities participating in sports. So the one thing, or one of the major things I do want to get across is that, <clears throat> yes, we are absolutely a, a sports program at our core. Uh, sports training and competition is what we have grown up with. Um, 
the program again was founded in 1968, which I'll talk about the, the history of that in, in a little bit, but that has been the core of what we've been doing for a long, long time. However, when I talk about Special Olympics now, I talk about uh, the variety of initiatives that we have in addition to sports training and competition, which have become critical pieces of who we are and what we do within the Special Olympics organization. So I'll talk about those uh, as well as we kind of move forward. And the reason I bring those up now is really sort of what the goal, the overarching goal is of our organization. And the ultimate goal of Special Olympics is basically to help people with intellectual disabilities participate as productive and respective members of society at large. And we do that through sports. That was the vehicle that we were able to showcase the abilities of our athletes, introduce our athletes to the community at large, and really show off what we're able uh, to be able to do and what our athletes are able to do. And so our athletes can be accepted by our community, whether it be from coaches or volunteers or corporate partners who are seeing what our athletes are capable of that are then willing to offer jobs and, and things like that, but also connecting to other organizations that serve the population that we serve. So part of what we're able to do is we have quite a number of different partnerships with both uh, organizations that serve our younger athletes, uh, especially the Department of Education, but also organizations that serve our older athletes. So when we're talking about Goodwill or the ARC um, or SECO or quite, quite a number of other organizations that serve people, uh, adults with intellectual disabilities as well. Um, those partnerships have served us so that we can improve our athletes' physical fitness, improve our athletes' health, uh, improve our athletes' job opportunities um, all the way down the line. So what we have discovered through multiple studies is that participation in Special Olympics actually impacts our athletes in a number of ways. Um, we have found that athletes do better at school if they participate in Special Olympics. Athletes do better in the workplace. And when I say better, what that means is that they have um, uh, are more effective at work, but also tend to have longer work histories uh, and are able to stay in a job for longer, a longer period of time be more, more effective because they have uh, increased ability to work with others, but also increased fitness and strength. Um, and then athletes are also doing better at home. And what that also means is how they're assisting by taking on responsibilities at home, whether that's uh, chores or helping look after a loved one or whatever it might be. Uh, we have seen consistent studies which have shown that uh, increased participation, length of participation in Special Olympics is an indicator of uh, increase in uh, productivity in those three different areas. So we've seen direct correlation there, which has been really critical and something that, that we've anecdotally seen, but it's nice to see that the studies that we've um, been able to be connected with have, have borne that out. We do have a athlete oath. That is something that we have said say at, at the beginning of every one of our Special Olympics competitions, which is, uh, and an athlete actually says this and all the other athletes repeat after them, which is let me win. But if I cannot win, let me be brave in the attempt. So really what our, we're looking for is our athletes to always give their best effort be brave in the attempt uh, and fight through, fight through adversity. So a little bit about the history of Special Olympics and where we, where we started, um, how this whole thing came together for us. Um, what I would like to say is we, to give you an idea of the scope of the program now, and then as we kind of look back to where we started. So right now, Special Olympics is in uh, about 178 to 180 countries. Um, we have participation of well over 6 million Special Olympics athletes globally. Uh, here in Hawaii, we have approximately 3,500 Special Olympics athletes that are participating in our program. Uh, here in the Hawaii program, we are statewide, so we do have participation on all islands, including um, Molokai and Lanai. Um, we I know that there's folks on from all of Asia Pacific on this call. We are not directly connected with the other programs in Asia Pacific. We're directly, we're directly connected through US. I believe some of those programs have connected uh, through Asia Pacific, um, but we've always offered uh, a helping hand wherever we can um, and, and continue to do so. In fact, I was just looking earlier to see that I saw Guam had a, a a softball competition in August, uh, which was great to see on their Facebook page uh, as well. So great to see that they're back up and running post COVID as well. Um, but looking backwards, we were founded again in 1968. So the founder of Special Olympics is Eunice Kennedy Shriver. Um, if you have not heard of her, she's uh, an amazing, remarkable woman. So, so two pieces of the name will sound familiar. So again, Kennedy being the middle name. So Eunice Kennedy Shriver is sister of John F. Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy and Ted Kennedy. And the last name Shriver. So Eunice was married to Sergeant Shriver, who was 
a, pre a vice presidential candidate, but also founder of the Peace Corps uh, and a very influential uh, person himself. Um, but Eunice Kennedy Shriver, one of her siblings was named uh, Rosemary, who she was very close to as they were growing up. They were relatively close in age. But Rosemary was born with an intellectual disability. <clears throat> and as she got older, it became more and more apparent and had more and more of an impact on her life. So as Rosemary was growing up and she started to encounter more challenges in her life, and there was also a lot of pressure on uh, the siblings in that generation of the Kennedy family, um, she started to have more and more challenges and her disability started to become more and more uh, prevalent. And the family decided that they were going to try an experimental procedure to see if they could do something to help um, solve that problem. Uh, and so at that time, the procedure was called lobotomy and it did not work out as expected. And Rosemary basically lived in a convent, was taken care of by nuns in a convent um, for the remainder of her life. So this was an extre extremely impactful moment in the lives of uh, that generation of the Kennedy family. Uh, and Eunice Kennedy Shriver in particular use this as an impetus basically to look for ways to serve people with intellectual disabilities. Um, and luckily, John F. Kennedy was also president uh, in the early 60s at that time uh, and started, they started a number of different programs to serve people with, with intellectual disabilities. And the Joseph P. Kennedy Foundation was started at that time, uh, providing uh, financial resources for organizations that wanted to serve people with intellectual disabilities. And then in 1968, Special Olympics was founded. Um, it originally started at an event in Soldier Field in Chicago and basically was spread quickly throughout the United States into Canada and then globally across the globe. Uh, and again, now we're well over 6 million athletes in over 180 different countries. I'll tell you a quick story there about uh, Special Olympics. Now, for those of you that may have been participated with Special Olympics and know a little bit about us, uh, we offer a dance quite often at many of our two-day or three-day or in some cases even one-day events. And the Special Olympics dance was a tradition going all the way back to 1968. So when Eunice Kennedy Shriver decided, okay, we're gonna have this big event at Soldier Field and we're gonna have all these athletes come together in Chicago to kick off uh, the birth essentially of Special Olympics. They decided we need a social event to go along with the competition that's gonna be happening on Soldier Field, which included track, but also some other events as well. And then the story goes that they decided they were gonna rent out the fanciest ballroom and the nicest hotel in Chicago. and. At that time, my understanding is that it was the Hyatt. And so they rented out the Hyatt for, I think it was a Saturday night of that event. And they said, you know, we're gonna hold a dance here for all the participants, all these Special Olympics participants that are coming here, all these individuals with intellectual disabilities. But what I wanna share with you guys is that now back in the 60s, if you had a child with an intellectual disability, quite often you were encouraged to institutionalize that child. Quite often you were told from a doctor or a pediatrician or somebody from a state government agency that um, this child will not be able to participate or contribute to our community. Um, this child will be a burden to you and your family for the rest of your life. And a good option for you will be to institutionalize this child because um, it will take that burden off of you. Um, and so quite often uh, back in, that, in those times, um, it was viewed negatively if your family had an individual with a disability. <clears throat> and so this was a big eye opener and a shocker to many of the people in that community in Chicago at that time that you were gonna have a whole ballroom fill, filled with people with intellectual disabilities when at the time, again, again the, the concept was um, the way folks were looked at was much differently. Well, anyways, the event was a massive success. And what we have found and what we've seen this over and over again, whereas uh, if any of you guys can remember back to some of those first dances you went to, whether it was in middle school or whether it was in high school and the music came on and quite often there were not a lot of people that were willing to get on the dance floor because everybody's super conscious of themselves and super conscious of what they look like and they don't want to be the first one and they don't want to look like a fool and they don't want to look silly. Um, what we found is that music is magic for our athletes and if they hear the music, they're going to dance and they don't care um, what they look like or they don't care. Uh, whether they've got a partner or they don't care if they're dancing a group of one, two, or three, they're going to enjoy the music and they're going to feel how they're going to feel and they're going to enjoy it. 
Um, and so that's basically what happened. And that basically spawned a tradition among all Special Olympics programs where we have events, uh, dances at almost every major event that goes on, whether it's an international event, a national event, or a, or a state games. And we see the same thing. Our athletes absolutely love it. It's a social, it's an outlet, it's a social aspect. Um, and they, if, if I walk through a dance and um, escape without dancing, uh, it's almost impossible. I have 20 athletes who come over and grab my hand and make me get on the dance floor and dance with them. Uh, and I love it. You know, I don't love dancing. I will do it, but they get me out there and they dance because they just realize that it's just, they can let loose and, and absolutely um, enjoy uh, just the feeling of, of moving with the music. So that's a, a big part of, of who our athletes are and what they're capable of doing. Um, the program has continued to grow. Uh, we are again called Special Olympics. Um, we do actually have an agreement with the International Olympic Committee to use the term Olympics. And that's partly why when you come to a Special Olympics event, uh, you get the sense of that this is an Olympic event because you recognize how we run things. So we have an opening ceremonies. We have our flame of hope. We light the cauldron. When we start all of our opening ceremonies, we have all of our oaths. Um, we do multi-day, multi-sport events, et cetera. And so we model our competitions after the Olympic Games. Um, we, to talk a little bit about our numbers, so I, I've explained a little bit about what we look like from a statewide standpoint and a global standpoint, but I do wanna talk a little bit about the larger numbers as well. So we actually use approximately, so pre-COVID 2019, we actually used 11,000 volunteers to run our program. Um, now, a lot of these, for example, at our summer games alone, so summer games, again, is the event I mentioned at University of Hawaii, where we're conducting track, swimming, powerlifting, and softball over a three-day period. Uh, we use over 2,500 volunteers to make that event happen um, alone. We get our volunteers from all aspects of the community, whether it's corporate partners, um, we have a, a huge number of volunteers come out from all the different branches of the military and quite a number of other community volunteers from a whole number of uh, civic organizations come out to support us as well. Um, but over 10,000 volunteers a year, we have uh, over 700 certified coaches that participate to make the program go, coaches being the most critical volunteer in all of our program. Uh, what we say is where the rubber meets the road, so they're the one providing direct service to all of the 3,500 athletes that are participating in our program on a year-round basis. All of our coaches go through a, a, certifi a certification program, so that means we actually bring them in and run them through a training program on how to teach the skills and drills of each sport before they go out there and actually start working with our Special Olympics athletes. Um, but we also provide some training with them on how do you work and interact and coach individuals with intellectual disabilities. So I want to pause here just for a second just to talk about this because we also want to make this uh, this presentation a little bit relevant for all of you. So what I want to do, what I want to say is uh, how much I appreciate and how much we appreciate the work that all of you do. So we know that you guys in many cases are preparing, preparing, preparing. We know that you're also providing services on a regular basis, many of which we don't ever hear about until there's a major crisis that's going on within our communities. Um, but I've known, I, I've seen um, how you guys have responded. Um, you know, I, I specifically know how you guys responded in some cases with uh, the events that happened in Diamond Head last year, or might have been, sorry, two years ago now, um, or a number of other cases, but your eyes are always preparing for other major happenings which could be going on, and, and we really appreciate that. But we know that part of the reason why you want to focus on the DEI is because when you have crisis emergency and crisis management, um, that you've got to be able to, to be prepared to communicate with all aspects of the population. And that's something that we obviously spend a lot of time and focus on. So one of the things that we do is we like to make sure that we provide training where we can and, and to who we can to make sure that our coaches are prepared to work with our Special Olympics athletes. But it goes well, well beyond that. When, uh, I'm gonna talk to you all in just a minute about one of the core programs that we have outside of sports, which is our health program. Um, and one of the biggest pieces to that is making sure that medical providers are prepared to spend time to communicate with our athletes uh, as well, which is a, a major misconception within uh, the medical community or really within the community at, at large is that in many cases, um, individuals with intellectual disabilities, uh, have greater access, get better health care, uh, et cetera, when in fact the opposite is true. And quite often a lot of that has to do with uh, the training and preparedness of our medical providers. So how do we equate this to what you all are doing um, as far as communication? So again, I guess what we're asking for and, and where maybe we can be of help uh, down the line in the future is in when you guys are setting up crisis communication plans, is there a component there 
to work with individuals with intellectual disabilities. So I know quite often you guys are need, needing to get mass information out to quite a number of people. And in some cases it have, has to happen quickly. And so then the question says, okay, so how do, how do we, how are we gonna communicate with those um, which may need some extra time, which may need some, um, some extra coordination, which may need some um, extra ability to, to uh, develop those communication channels. How are we gonna do this in a crisis situation? Um, we're obviously in most cases not dealing with crisis situations. We're dealing with you know general sports programs or general programs that are going on. And so the question is, how do you develop that, and how do you think about that in your crisis communication plans? I know that uh, Diana was sharing with me, and Anne Marie and Cindy were all were all sharing me, with me that you guys have had the opportunity to work with or have have heard from some other organizations from the communities uh, here in Hawaii and across Asia Pacific, which have dealt with. Um, some other aspects of our community, which may also have disabilities, uh, and what you might need to do to consider when you're working with them as well. So uh, I do want to put that out there that you know we'd be happy to try and support in whatever we ways that we can if that's part of something that you guys need to consider in your crisis communication plans. Um, so with that being said, I, I do want to talk a little bit about um, the medical program, which which I've alluded to. So. Quite often, what, what we've discovered is that um, in years and years of working with our Special Olympics athletes is that what we were seeing is that quite a number of athletes had unmet medical needs. Um, so again, there's a common misconception out there that people with disabilities get greater health care, have better access to health care, um, and get more health care. And in fact, the opposite is true we would see athletes coming to practice and it now on average if we have a team of 10 athletes we see that um something like five are overweight or obese we see at least three to four they might have uh, tooth decay we see a couple with hearing loss we have multiple athletes that have strength flexibility and balance issues uh etc and so what we're seeing quite often is that our athletes are not have health needs that are not being met um, we would hear this anecdotally from coaches and parents over and over and over again. And then the question was, um, Special Olympics decided to really delve into this because the thought pattern was, hey, if nobody else is, is identifying this, if nobody else, nobody else is going to treat this, then we're going to jump in here and we're going to do something about this. So where Special Olympics started, and this was, goes back about 20 years now, is with our healthy athlete screenings. So this basically started with a partnership where we started working with some dental professionals and, um, and vision professionals. Uh, and hearing professionals, medical professionals on what do we need to do to, to, to provide screenings for our athletes. And what grew out of that was this medical screening process called our Healthy Athlete Program. So for, on the oral health side, it became a program called Special, Special Smiles. Uh, on the hearing side, it became Healthy Hearing. Um, and uh, on the vision side, it became Opening Eyes. And so we started screening all of our athletes for medical issues. And what we started discovering is, was that in many cases untreated um, issues which spanned a whole variety of, of, of whether it was decay all the way to infection uh, in oral care we were seeing vision loss and nobody treating it from the standpoint of uh, no prescription glasses uh, we were seeing hearing loss some of that it was simply due to earwax buildup and nobody was checking our athletes hearing and so nobody was actually removing earwax um, and so we started all these health screening processes and we started recognizing that there was this massive need for our athletes. The screening process expanded and now we actually do screenings in seven, six different disciplines, including the three that I mentioned, but then we added in a program called physical, um, uh, Fun Fitness, where we have physical therapists that are checking flexibility, balance, strength, bone density, um, things like that. We have podiatrists that are checking our athletes' feet, their gait, their arches, things like that. We have another one called Strong Minds, uh, strong, strong minds is something that where we can help our athletes work through uh, anxi anxiety. Um, I don't want to say as clinical as depression, but definitely um, anxiety and stress. And then we have a seventh discipline now where we have a program called MedFest, where we're able to provide free medicals for all of our athletes who need it. And, and getting a medical is something required for athletes every three years. So I was just talking to one of our, uh, our the person that runs our, our healthy athlete program just earlier today. She just got back from a clinic that we just ran in Kona. So one of our MedFest clinics that we just ran in Kona. I was talking to one of the parents of one of the, the Special Olympics athletes who just went through and, and got an all clear to be able to participate for Special Olympics. And her name is Kalei. And um, the dad came up to, the dad's name is Paul. He came up to our healthy athlete um, a staff member, her name is Michelle. And he said, you know, Michelle, I really want to talk to you about this because um, this is something that 
was really critical uh, for Calais. And this happened about 10 years ago and I never really shared it with any of you guys, but I wanted you to really know. So when you started your healthy athlete screenings, he said she went through and it was one of the first years that we were doing bone density screenings. And what they discovered at the bone density screening was that she had osteopenia, which, um, and she was younger. Um, and it was something that her, her uh, doctor was not screening for. She was a little bit younger than where they started screening for that. And what we found out, she said, we were able to find out that she had osteopenia, which would have less led to osteoporosis. Um, but we were able to get that screening. We got that referral. We immediately got her back here in Kona, had her checked out. And yes, she did have it. And we were able to start treating that immediately, get her on medication and start treating that. And so that we were able to avoid osteoporosis. So that's really the goal of what we're trying to do within Special Olympics within our health program to make sure that we've got these screenings that are going on. Um, the other thing that's kind of a crazy statistic that we've heard is that our athletes on average from a global standpoint, individuals with intellectual disabilities are uh, likely to die 16 years younger than the general population and quite often for issues that are treatable. Um, we have other, we've discovered other circumstances where, for example, an athlete uh, in Kona who never made it through a healthy athlete screening, this has happened just as we were kind of, some of these things were, were starting to kick off, um, but had a, he was a nonverbal athlete um, and he ended up with an infection in his mouth, um, wasn't able to relay that. Nobody knew exactly. And he was starting to have a, a variety of behaviors where he was lashing out um, and acting violently. And everybody thought that had something to do with his developmental disability. But in fact, it was because he was in so much pain due to the infection in his mouth. And then the infection basically spread to his, uh, all the way into his brain um, and had much, had really dire consequences. And so one of the things that we have learned for this is that quite often we really have to pay attention to the messages that we're getting from our athletes, whether they're verbal or nonverbal, and the cues that they're giving us and not chuck everything up to the fact that our athletes have an intellectual disability and that we have to need to make sure that they have access to quality healthcare, just like everybody else that you and I take for granted. What we have noticed and quite often, and this is another story just from um, two weeks ago, is that we had another athlete here on Oahu who has very limited vision, um, but, and, and, and closes his eyes almost all the way. And what we had found out was that he had, uh, he had um, unfortunately been um, assaulted earlier in his life and it impacted sort of the way uh, he used his, his eyes and his vision but it had never been treated before. And, and the assumption quite often was that people just let it go because the assumption was, well, it's just part of his intellectual disability. That's why he looks like that. That's why he, he's acting like that. That's why he's behaving like that. That's why his eyes are, are look like that. Uh, but we were able to get him some follow-up care and it looks like they're gonna be able to do some treatments so that he can actually have better vision. Um, and so we run across this uh, uh, quite a number of times where there's a assumption that's being made, it's called diagnostic overshadowing, that because an athlete can't catch a ball or is not hearing very well, or is acting in a, in a behavior that is something unusual to them, um, that is tied into their intellectual disability and has nothing to do with actual pending and critical health needs that they might have going on right in that, in that moment. So that's something that Special Olympics is very invested in. So now we make sure that our athletes have access to follow-up care. So we partner with quite a number of different organizations to make sure that our athletes get follow-up care and wherever they have critical needs. But one of the other critical pieces to this is making sure that, uh, as I mentioned before, quite often we have quite a number of medical professionals that are not trained or to work with people with intellectual disabilities. Um, so what does that training look like, right? So what is that, that essentially really focuses on the communication piece is one, um, quite often we'll have athletes say, you know, please speak to me, not just the people around me, treat me as a person. I can understand, but you have to take the time to break it down for me so that I do understand what it is that you're telling me. Now, quite often doctors feel like they don't have enough time. So they're gonna try and convey the information as quickly as they can and move on to the next patient, especially in the emergency room setting or in some other settings like that. What's critical for us is to be able to get in there and provide that training to say like, you have an obligation to take that extra minute or two to identify that this athlete might have intellectual disability, has the ability to understand what you're saying, but you need to take the time to break it down for them in a way that they can understand so they can be part of the decision-making process around their own health and provide them with the respect um, that we all ask for. 
in, in all of those types of settings. Um, so that's a critical piece of what Special Olympics is doing too. We actually have athletes that go help us provide training to medical providers. One of the other reasons that we have all these healthy athlete screenings is when we do our healthy athlete, uh, our major healthy athlete screening is at our summer games, where we'll have something like 300 medical uh, and lay volunteers come out to do all of these screenings, as that they get the opportunity to work directly with intellectual athletes with intellectual disabilities, one on one for an entire day, and they'll see multiple athletes and that will help give them the training that they provide and the experience that they need so that hopefully they'll be able to take it back to whatever practice they're in, whether it's private practice or whether they're working at one of the major um, uh, health providers, so that they have that ability to go back and, and translate that into what they do on a daily basis. Um, I could go on and on, guys, about what we're doing on the health field, but I do want to talk about one other major, or really two other major initiatives that we have within Special Olympics as well. Um, and I know that I'm uh, at about supposed to stop at around 45 minutes and then do some Q&A. So uh, I'll, I'll start to, to slowly wrap this up, um, is that we have a major program now called Unified Champion Schools. So Unified Champion Schools was an offshoot of our participation within the school system. So quite often uh, in the early days, uh, the goal was to get schools involved in our traditional core program of Special Olympic sports. Um, where that has really expanded to now is our Unified Champion Schools program. So there's three major components to what we're trying to do within Unified Champion Schools. So one is Unified Sports. So what Unified Sports is, is basically pairing special education students within the special education classrooms up with uh, their general education peers. So in other words, students that do not have disabilities playing on the same teams. Now, the, the purpose of Unified Sports, because we do the both at the youth level, but also at the adult level, is to basically break down the barriers between people with and without disabilities. Because when you start playing sports with somebody or having other activities with them that you enjoy, it really starts to uh, break down that, oh, some you have a disability, I don't have a disability, you're in special ed, I'm not in special ed. Uh, it breaks that really down. Right now we're just teammates, we're just having fun, we're playing basketball together, we're playing bots together, we're, we're bowling together, whatever it might mean, and it really starts to break down those, those barriers. Um, the other major prongs of the Unified Champion Schools program are a whole school engagement. So the goal is there, so yes, we might have a unified sports team, but that might include, you know, five general education students and five special education students on a basketball team. And then we're only really impacting those 10 different students. So how do we let the whole school know about this? And we do this through uh, campaigns called, um, one is called Spread the Word to End the Word. So many of you probably know that um, for quite a number of years, the number one put down you would hear in the school system when somebody was trying to say something nasty to somebody else is they would call them the R word, right? The R word being retard, right? So again, trying to say that uh, I'm gonna compare you to somebody who has an intellectual disability by essentially saying that you're doing something that is dumb or stupid. Um, and so that's something we've been really fighting against the so Special Olympics and, and Best Buddies and some of the organizations that have kind of joined together for the Spread the Word to End the Word campaign. Um, and we do those school-wide, but it, those are really with a much larger message, right? So the message is how to be inclusive, how to be accepting of everybody regarding of uh, ability, disability, ethnicity. It doesn't really matter, right? We need to include everybody and accept everybody and respect everybody within our entire school uh, and also tie that into things like anti-bullying campaigns. So that's a big feature of what we do within our Unified Champion Schools um, within the whole school engagement piece. Um, but then we also have inclusive leadership. So the goal there is to who are gonna design these activities, who are gonna make these things possible. And we do that by creating clubs within the school where we have representation among general education and special education, where they're gonna help put these types of activities on. Um, a great offshoot of this, I'll give you an example, is Farrington High School. So Farrington High School started Unified Champion School program. In fact, they got awarded nationally for their Unified Champion School program. Um, but what they did was one of the pieces to this is they started the Friends Club. So the Friends Club was um, twice a week, in some cases, three times a week, depending on the schedule. Um, members of the Friends Club would sit together with um, all the students from the special education classrooms. And the volunteers for this Friends Club just, just happened to be most of the varsity athletes, many of them football players, basketball players, women, uh, many members of the girls' basketball and volleyball teams joined. Um, and so now you have these long tables filled with the special ed department and many of these student athletes who of course many of whom are um, clearly the most athletic in the school but also some of the most popular kids in the school and what did that do really basically said hey these students we accept them they're part of who we are they're part of you know our the the, the farrington gov culture um, we need to respect them and when they're 
uh, walking down the hallway and they see each other, they're high-fiving, they're saying hello, they're hanging out. Um, and so what they really did is spread a message across the school that, hey, we need to respect everybody here. And luckily, uh, they've got a great administration who really support that as well. Uh, and where this really culminated was, um, I think going back to 2018, the homecoming queen uh, from Farrington High School was a special uh, Olympics athlete, special education student named Jasmine. Um, so they really lived it. That was the epitome of what Unified Champion Schools is all about, acceptance and inclusion. Uh, and it wasn't tokenism. It was She was somebody that everybody loved because she just had a great personality personality. She spread her enthusiasm throughout the school, and she was respected for what she was able to do with, within that school as well. So that was really an amazing story there. Um, as we start to wrap up, the one other program I really wanted to mention was something that we call um, as the acronym ALPS, ALPS, which stands for our Athlete Leadership Programs, um, and an offshoot of that, which is our global, which is our Health Messenger Program. Um, so I want to bring this up because Peter uh, Gumatauto, uh, Anne Marie's son, is actually one of our health messengers. Um, so we have a program which basically provides uh, leadership opportunities for our athletes, but also the opportunity for them to become public speakers. Um, in fact, we have a Toastmasters club made up of all Special Olympics athletes. In fact, we are the only Toastmasters club in the nation, or we think globally, that is made up of entirely all Special Olympics athletes that participate in the program. All of them have gone through a training that is provided by one of our staff members who's amazing. Her name is Nipo, um, and she provides our, our global messenger training for all of our athletes. And then they have the opportunity to learn how to write and give speeches uh, in public. And then an offshoot of that, and also uh, in, in partnership with our health program, is we have now Special Olympics athletes who are health messengers. And their goal is also to spread the word of health on all the different pieces of, of that, including our fitness programs, our walking programs, how to stay healthy as an athlete, because you need to represent all other athletes. And right, our goal is to be healthy so that we can participate in sports and stay fit. And so Peter is one of those athletes that went through that training and became one of our health messengers. And in fact, inspired by his mom's work, um, he specifically developed a training, which we um, we started doing all types of virtual workouts during COVID. And Peter specifically designed a workout for athletes with mobility issues. So he designed an athlete for anybody utilizing a wheelchair on how to do a 30 minute workout um, that would be conducive to somebody utilizing a wheelchair. And so, and he did that on his own, obviously with some support from his family, um, but did a fantastic job. And he actually ran the workout virtually for all of our athletes that were participating in the workout um, that day. So just again, another shout out to, to Peter and his family. Um, we have quite a number of other programs that are going on uh, year round and statewide. Uh, I do want to leave you guys just with, a, before we do the Q&A, just a little bit of an anecdotal story about, about one of our athletes that's really had an impact on me and been one of the driving forces of, of why I'm continually inspired by our athletes and our movement. Um, for any of you guys that live on Oahu, and I know we have representation from quite a number of different locations on the call today, but if, for anybody that lives on Oahu, if you had gone to the movies at Consolidated Theaters for years, you might have met a young woman by the name of Cassidy Wall. So Cassidy is an amazing athlete. She's she's probably, uh, I'm in my 50s now, so I think Cass and I have always been close to the same age. I believe she's in her 50s now, um, but was an employee at Consolidated for probably close to 20 years. But Cass was born with part of her cerebral missing um, and uh, had multiple issues growing up because of that. In fact, she wasn't able to walk for quite a number of years, had a rod put in her back, um, the part of her brain that was missing controlled balance. Um, and so she started out in Special Olympics at a very early age. She had a fantastic coach. She had a fantastic family. She had a great special education teacher. And they got her involved with Special Olympics and she started using a wheelchair to participate at first. Well, the magic of magic, you know, her brain started to make other connections and she had folks that were really willing to work with her, physical therapists, and she was able to work her way out of that wheelchair and start utilizing a walker and other assistive devices. And she started participating in Special Olympics using, again, starting with the wheelchair, then using the walker, started doing the 15 meter assisted walk, then the 25 meter assisted walk, and then she got rid of the walker and she was able to do walking events up to 50 meters. And then ultimately, Cass started participating in the 400 meter walk. Um, no assisted device. She just continued to work and work and work and started participating in that. Well, Cass belongs to a team by the name of the Mighty Ducks and the Mighty Ducks started a powerlifting program about 15 years ago. And she saw all of her good friends doing powerlifting and said, I wanna do powerlifting too. We were really worried about this because Cass was literally about hundred pounds and about four foot eight um, and had a rod in her back and didn't have the greatest balance. Um, but we started Cassily off with a broomstick 
and that's where she started. Now to compete in Special Olympics at the beginning weight is 35 pounds. Um, and uh, you need to be able to do that minimum weight, uh, sorry, 25 pounds on each side. So 50 pounds plus the bar, 60 pounds minimum weight um, is what she would need to be able to do to do the opening weight. Um, and Castley tried and tried and tried, ultimately um, got there. And so the reason I tell this story is that I've had many people walk into a gym and they've seen Castley powerlifting. And she's had about 75 or 85 pounds on the bar, which if you're deadlifting, it doesn't look like a lot of weight. It's a number of small weights on there. Um, but she's able to complete that weight. She started being able to complete that weight in her 40s. Um, and why this is such a massive success story to me is because Castley started off not being able to walk. And now Castley started powerlifting with a broomstick, which weighs, what, three or four pounds. And now she's lifting 65 pounds off the floor, which is the ultimate as far as I can see in achievement, as far as athletic goes. On the flip side of that, we have a young man in Kona that can deadlift 500 pounds straight off the floor. Everybody oohs and ahs and gasps when he does that because it is a very impressive feat. But I will always think back to what Castley is able to do because of what she's overcome to lift 65 pounds and view that just as equally as I see Isaiah Wong's 500 pound lift from Kona. So um, I'm going to wrap it up with that, guys. So I'm at about, I think we're at about 150, and I know we wanted to leave a few minutes for Q&A. Um, I know I've talked about a lot, and um, obviously I could talk for a long time about Special Olympics. It's been around for a long time, um, and uh, I really appreciate um, you guys listening to me and, and hope I can answer any questions. Wow. Thank you, Dan. Um, I, I want to let um, Anne-Marie chime in, and then I know um, some folks on our staff have questions as well, but I just want to thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the work that you and Special Olympics do in the community. It's critical work. I noticed on your website that October is Down Syndrome Awareness Month, so this talk is especially timely. And um, I, I just loved hearing some of the stories that you shared. I, I'm big on stories, so I loved hearing about, um, you know, the story, the last story, Castley. That was tremendously inspiring. Um, loved hearing about Peter Gumatautau and his story. I wanted to hear more about. Um, how you folks pivoted during the pandemic and how you had to change change the way you do things. Um, I loved your um, comments and ideas about possibly partnering with the Red Cross here to um, do d disaster preparedness in, in communicating with uh, communities that folks that have intellectual disabilities. Um, wanted to hear more about how you managed to um, engage 10 to 12,000 volunteers every year. We're volunteer based too. So I, I will stop there and let others, I wanna encourage our staff um, to please raise their, raise their hands um, virtually or just jump in, jump on camera. If you have any questions at all for Dan and us or Special Olympics folks, thank you. I see a hand come up. I think that's Cheetah, right? Peter, go for it. Are you, are you muted, Cheetah? I'm not now, I think. Okay, so Dan, that was so inspiring. Uh, it was just like, I was blown away by all, uh, everything that you reported today. I mean, I know a little bit about Special Olympics. I used to raise money for them, but that was so many years ago. and. I did not become so intimately uh, knowledgeable of the, the real essence of, of Special Olympics, but I salute you. I mean, that was wonderful. But you know what I love the most, Dan? The ball, the dancing. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so, it's definitely a highlight for many of our athletes. That music is good for the soul. That's what it's all about. That's yeah, right. that that's, that's fantastic. Okay, my last question. Do do you get funding from the International Olympics Committee? We do not get anything from the IOC. Um, oh. We're not uh, we're not connected in that way to the IOC um, in any way. We are connected to our national our international uh, organization, which is Special Olympics Inc., which is located in Washington D.C. They they are the headquarters for our global um, operations. Um, Special Olympics is is a little bit weird in that we're we grew up in the United States so that Special Olympics was, was every state has their own 
uh, 501c3. Everyone has their own nonprofit, whereas every other country has a national program. There is no national Special Olympics USA. We only get together when we go to international competitions. We come together and work together um, collaboratively. But um, so, uh, but we do. We don't get any funding from our parent organizations, Special Olympics. In fact, we pay an accreditation fee to them. Um, however, they provide a lot of resources for us. And they also, uh, we also do a lot of collaborative fundraising with them. So, um, uh, but no, we don't receive funding from the IOC or from our parent organization. Okay, thank you. You're doing a fantastic job. Keep it up. So, so Chita, that, that actually, uh, just to, to, to expand on that, but also Diana, just to go back to your one of your points. Um, so yes, yeah, so we need to raise, uh, here in Hawaii, we need to raise about 2.4 million annually is, is approximately our operating budget. And we do that every single way you guys can imagine, right? So we are pretty diverse in how we fundraise, a lot of special events. Um, we, a lot of foundation, a lot of grant writing, a lot of corporate partners, a lot of individual donations. Um, you're literally, you know, Dan, you're shaking your head, right? Probably the same, the same, right? You're, you're looking, <laughs> yeah. at every looking at every opportunity out there to raise funds. And so we are constantly, um, we are constantly fundraising. And then also a big piece of that, and it's um, something I should have mentioned, but hadn't, but I'm glad I'm having a chance now is that we charge $0 for anybody to participate in our program. Uh, we will not, we won't. Um, so the program is free. We do encourage, obviously we'd love it when our athletes help us fundraise, but, but if somebody doesn't, it wouldn't exclude them from participating. Um, and so the program is free. All of our programs are free, regardless of the type of program to all of our athletes and their families. Um, and then just to real jump real quick to Diane, your question of what did we do during COVID? That's a great question. Um, we did everything virtually. So we actually created fitness competitions online. Um, we did fitness, all types of fitness trainings uh, online with coaches. We found all the athletes that were interested and we started doing, uh, we taught, we probably have now hundreds of athletes that know how to use Zoom effectively um, mm -hmm. and their families uh, very effectively. We started doing uh, trainings uh, three days a week for all of our athletes. In fact, we did Monday, we do, uh, we'd, we would do a variety of different types of trainings or interactive activities with our athletes. We would do a workout for all of our athletes on every Wednesday, which we're still doing now for those that still like to do the virtual activities. And we did a dance every Friday afternoon. So we had like probably a group of 15 different DJs across the state that donated their time and would do virtual dances for us every Friday afternoon at four o'clock for our athletes across the state. And in fact, some cases from the mainland, we'd have athletes join us from the mainland as well that would join us for dances. And we're still doing those uh, uh, for many of our athletes that just still love it. They love that, that aspect as well. So we're doing those virtually. And then we found a way to use breakout rooms where we would have athletes actually competing in events like um, jumping jacks and planks and push-ups and sit-ups and all types of things like that and um, and timing them and 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 awarding them. We in fact had a, we have a great enough partnership with law enforcement as I think somebody mentioned earlier um, and we actually got uh, all the different county police departments to go hand deliver awards after after some of our uh, after some of our events, they would roll up in there with their sirens blaring and, and actually go to athletes' homes and hand out medals that they had won at some of our, our online fitness competitions and things like that. Oh, how so, yeah. So, that is wonderful. Thank you, Dan. You're welcome. Thank you. Other, other questions or comments? Anne Marie, did you want to jump in? Yeah, Dan, can you speak to how some of our island athletes have also represented Special Olympics in national and international events? Absolutely. So uh, like the Olympics, Special Olympics has a World Games every four years. Uh, the schedule has gotten a little bit off kilter due to COVID. Um, but we had our last, um, our last events uh, well, there's actually so so we have our, our athletes have the opportunity to go participate in USA Games. So our last group of athletes just participated last May, actually, in the USA Games in Orlando. Um, and so basically they represented Hawaii. So we had Huyo Hawaii, Team Hawaii, basically participating. We had about 30 athletes and coaches that went and participated there um, and competed against all the other U.S. programs, plus also programs from the Caribbean were invited to that specific, specific event because it was held so close in, in Florida. Um, but athletes also have the opportunity to go participate at a global level at the World Games. Excuse me. And so the last athletes we had that went to Abu Dhabi, we have athletes, uh, two athletes that will have the opportunity to go represent, uh, be part of Team USA uh, in Berlin um, coming up uh, in 2023. Yeah, so 
next year, actually, next summer. Um, and so athletes do have the opportunity to go on in advance, but Special Olympics is very much grassroots. And what I mean by that is we actually, I know we're closing right in on time. So um, it is uh, any athlete at any ability level has the opportunity to advance. I don't have the time to explain that whole process right now, but um, we, we do, it's not just the best athletes. It's actually many athletes have the opportunity to advance to that, that level. Thank you, Dan. I know Mary had a question. Maybe if it's a quick one, Mary, you want to jump on? Yes. Hi, Dan. Thank, uh, thank you so much for sharing all your info. Um, we're here on Guam. My, my question was really, do you have any partners with any of these neighboring islands? So Guam, NMI, American Samoa, and, you know, and even if not, are you still doing virtual programs that they could be um, participate in? So the answer is uh, we do not have a direct connection. I, that's why I was looking for, uh, and I know that they so I saw that they are back up and running on their Facebook page in Guam. Um, and, I, and Frank, I believe, is there. We are more than willing to partner with them, support, uh, do anything that, um, uh, and happy to reach out post-COVID if there's any interest at all. Um, but absolutely, we would love participation. Um, and we can definitely, if we can create that link, we would love to invite them to anything we're doing virtually. That would be great. Oh, awesome. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Well, with that, um, I thank you again, Dan. Um, congratulations to all, everyone, the team at, at uh, Special Olympics. And thank you, Anne-Marie, for, for arranging mm -hmm. this great discussion today. Absolutely. And if I can just say, um, the Special Olympics Hawaii is really a, a top model program. We have been involved in Special Olympics on the East Coast, the West Coast, internationally. And... Um, the, the Hawaii chapter is just so active, involved, and, and providing so many different opportunities. So as a parent of an athlete, I just want to say thank you, Dan, for, for providing this, these services for our athletes and all the wonderful things that you do. Thank you very much, and thank you for sharing the story today. Thank you, Emory. Thank you, Dan. Thank, thank you to all of you for allowing me uh, in your day. Okay. Aloha. Thank Aloha. you. Aloha. Mahalo, Dan. Thank Bye. you.